know the story behind the deep sea fish, cod, haddock, sole, redfish, or halibut that you've ordered from your hotel menu? There's always a story behind the food we eat. It may be an everyday sort of story, it may be dramatic or adventurous, but it's always about people. This is the story of men who haul their living from the Atlantic, making it possible for us to order fish for dinner. It's really the story of men who go to sea on a trawler. A sturdy ship of wood or steel construction, varying in length from 110 to 130 feet. It's modern, diesel-driven, and efficient. But why do most of the deep-sea fishermen always head for the banks when there's the whole broad Atlantic to fish in? It's because the best deep-sea fishing grounds of the whole Atlantic are on the banks located just 120 miles from Nova Scotia. Long ago, this part of the continent settled below the sea level and formed a continental shelf. With hills and valleys, these hills form shallows in the ocean depth and are called the banks, such as Middle Ground, Canso Bank, Bankero, and others. The sun penetrates this shoal water varying from 25 to 100 fathoms, so that plankton, on which fish feed, is plentiful, making a natural feeding ground of almost all of the continental shelf. And today, captains from Nova Scotia and elsewhere chart their course to these same rich fishing grounds. On the way to the banks, the crew is busy on deck mending nets, which break often from the continuous strain of dragging over the seafloor. Nearing the banks, the mate measures the depth of water by the echo sounder, which the captain can check with his chart. And by radio telephone, he contacts other trawlers and keeps in touch with his home port. They're on the banks now, and the captain shouts, shoot the gear. While one of the crew on starboard lowers a door overside and unshackles it, a man brings the aft gallow starboard door into position at the same time. The huge net, 80 feet or more in length, goes overside. This is the most important part of the fishing gear. The cod end goes first, then the body and wings of the net, so that it streams out to windward in a conical shape. As the warps run off the winch. Now the doors in the starboard side drop simultaneously as the trawler speeds ahead. When the required amount of warp is run off the winch, the man at the forward gallows throws the messenger hook over the forward warp. This slides down under the water. There is a cable attached to the hook, and the winch draws the cable so that the hook grabs the aft towing warp and brings both warps together to the towing block on the aft rail. The man at the towing block locks the two towing ropes into position and removes the towing hook. Now the great net is towing behind the trawler. This is how the net looks underwater. The massive iron doors, weighing nearly a ton each, force the mouth of the net open so that the ground fish, haddock, cod, sole, and halibut, are swept into the net and are caught in the cod end as the net drags along. The trawler drags the net like this for an hour and a half. But even during this time, you can depend upon it that there are nets to mend and other jobs on deck to do.
Finally, the captain gives orders to haul the gear. They release the towing block, and the warps reel in the heavy doors. As the fore and aft doors reach the side of the trawler, they are shackled to the gallows. Then the wings come up. Note how torn this one is from the strain of towing. They haul the body of the net in by hand. There are literally fathoms of it. They're always glad when they see the cod end float to the surface because then they know they have a bumper catch. At this point, they put the lazy decky to work to haul in the balance of the net. A large catch like this could not be hauled in at one time, so they put a splitting strap on so that only 3,000 pounds of fish remain in the cod end, which they bring overside and empty. Then they tie the cod end, throw it overside, more fish slip through the body from the net back into the cod end, which is again brought over and emptied. This action is repeated until all the fish are out of the net. And because they're alive when they come out of the nets, they are that much fresher when they reach the market. Haddock, cod, sole form the bulk of the catch. But the choice halibut is often part of it too. The fish, split, gutted, and washed, are packed in layers of ice. And when the trawler reaches port, they are as firm and fresh as when they came from the water. Don't think men fare badly on a trawler. In addition to choice fish tidbits, they have all the fresh meat and vegetables they can eat, and it tastes even better at sea. When dusk sets in, most people relax and enjoy life a little, but not on a trawler. All night long, the business of hauling and setting the gear goes on. Other trawlers loom on the horizon and pass on. Dawn breaks over the sea. And the weary fishermen are manipulating the heavy doors of the net. But fishing pays off when at the end of the trip they have 75,000 or more pounds of fish in the hold. So the trawler fishermen bring you halibut, cod, sole, haddock, fresh from the bank. As an extra precaution, inspectors check the temperature of the fish as it's brought in, then skinned and filleted, fresh or fresh frozen, and ready for the pan. The harvest of the sea is brought to your table and mine. This then is the story behind these palatable seafoods made possible by the men who spend their lives on the tossing waters 
that cover the banks of the Atlantic water.